Good afternoon. I have been trying to encourage you guys all day to put one step on the water. One step of obedience. I do not mean by that continue to do what you have been doing all your Christian life. I don't. I mean slam the car in reverse, go back to the last junction and turn left. I want you to move into tandem riding in the kingdom of God. I want you to move into a place where your harmony begins to deepen. Yes? Yeah? Please, please don't think it's good enough to say, well, actually, we saw a healing a couple of years ago. I'm sure you did, because grace is grace. Yes? But you ought to be seeing stuff all the time <coughs> if you are an ordinary sinning Christian. If you're not, heaven help you. I mean, so much so, folks, that that when we, oh, I don't know, a while back, we, we were talking about this in the office, and, and the two ladies that were working for me then were reasonably new at this, and they um, were sitting in the kitchen, and I was in my office, and this guy came hobbling in, in extreme pain, um, because he was diabetic, and had got an infection in one of his feet. And the infection had gone up, you know, gangrene. And he smelt terrible, and he wasn't a Christian. Sorry, I don't put those two things together. I don't, non-Christian smell, you know, that's not... That's not true. Um, but he, he came in and he, he plonked himself down in the kitchen. He had his leg, his right leg it was, all strapped up. He told them that he was going to go in a hospital the following week to have it amputated below the knee. Um, we see a lot of amputations in our part of the world from, from this, from diabetics. Of, yeah? And... Um, so they made him a cuppa because they thought that might be their good Christian hospitality role, you know. I didn't even know this was going on. So they, they said, well, once he started drinking his tea and relaxed a bit, they said, can we, well, he said, what do you people do here precisely, you know. I mean, I came here because somebody said I should, but I don't know exactly what you do. So he said, well, we'll tell you. And they told him about the kingdom of God just exactly like I told you today, no different. And they said, uh, you sit there and enjoy your cup of tea, and while you're drinking your cup of tea, we will just pray. And they prayed with his, in his presence exactly the same as I was doing with our elbows and necks before lunch. Okay? I didn't do anything different than that. Because normally speaking, you know, when we pray with people, we're just interceding in front of their faces, aren't we? This isn't the same thing at all. This is the way that Jesus wanted it done, and the way that Jesus did it, which is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom and the cross, yeah? In front of them, and you saw what happened, and you saw the results in the congregation because it was bouncing all over the place, wasn't it? Hello? Ah! They did come back from lunch, Karen. Bless. Yeah? And as they were doing so, this gentleman started to say, well, I don't know. He said, I'm pretty sure the pain's getting better. So they kept going and they kept going. And in the end, he took the strapping off his leg, which the girl said was pretty foul, actually, you know, for unmedical people to see that sort of thing took it off his leg and said the more we proclaim the good news of the cross you could actually see the infection line you know coming down the leg across the ankle and out through the toes and I was gone 
and he walked out holding his walking stick and he wasn't in any pain at all did he give his life to Christ I've absolutely no idea I mean you know it's only one leper in ten that comes back you know <laughs> however I was telling somebody in America I forget who it was now that story and they said well funny you should say that got a girlfriend in hospital who's just about to have a foot amputated for the same reason and this lady hung up on me and ran around the hospital and prayed yeah, and came away didn't see anything I don't think because the um, you know the foot was covered in the blankets and things in the hospital but she was getting ready to have her ankle amputated for exactly the same reason and the amputation never happened because the foot was completely restored the doctor sent her home because I don't quite know why you've booked in really there's nothing wrong with you I love it I do I, 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 yeah if you could only get your brains out of the way that's the trouble you, you just got to be simple right 1 Corinthians 1 18 any takers I know it 1 Corinthians 1 18 to save you looking it up it says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to those of us who are being saved it is the power of God whoa stop I was brought up on my conversion to Christianity in the world of charismania where I clearly understood that the Holy Spirit was the power of God the Bible doesn't say that it says the message of the cross is the power of God but nobody ever told me what the message of the cross was I tried and somebody eventually said well it means that if you're a Christian with any luck at a following wind you may go to heaven when you die well that's not particularly good news if you're in a lot of trouble is that yeah the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to those of us who are being saved it is the power of God yes if you want the power of God at your fingertips get with the message of the cross anybody ever taught you that before it says it 1 Corinthians 1 18 it could not be clearer the power of God is in the message of the cross yeah uh, it does not say the power of God is in how good you are at putting over the message it says the power is in the message yeah it does not say the power of God lies in the message of the cross according to your ecclesiastical rank what it says is the power is in the message yes it doesn't even say the power of God lies in how well people actually hear what you're saying and understand it it says the power of God is in the message yes so when you proclaim the kingdom of God like I've been doing all day long you must include the message of the cross yes because the cross is the great ending to Jesus's ministry on earth really yes I mean after that you get resurrection and you get ascension and you get Pentecost so he's still here doing the biz yeah but basically it locks in place everything that Jesus was saying and doing okay the message of the cross you see the best example I can tell you really how do you use the message of the cross well God has known this for a long time God knew how this message worked a long time before Jesus came yeah knew the message of the cross I don't know how many of you read about Moses I do I like Moses a lot yes 
Um, I'm looking forward to meeting him one day. I have deep respect for Mose. He's a good man. Ah, I can't do this, Lord. I'm not good enough. Yes, you are. What have, what have you got in your hand? What he had in his hand was what became known as the staff of God. Yes? What I want you to know is that Moses was a sort of pre-runner of Jesus. Okay? He wasn't the Messiah. Of course he wasn't. You can't get salvation through Moses. Yeah? But he was, in many ways, the great lawgiver. Yes? Moses brought the law and Jesus brought the spirit and the truth. Okay? The grace and truth, rather. So here we are with Moses, and Moses knew how to handle bits of wood. Believe me, he did, right? Just like God has always known how to handle bits of wood. And God always knows that the way to get at you and me is through using a bit of wood. Are you with me? Are you all still awake? Just, just nudge the person next to you, will you? Make sure they're all right. Okay. You see, Moses set off into Egypt with something that Scripture knows as the staff of God. And I think of the cross exactly the same way. The cross itself, the wooden bit, yes, is the staff of God. So here we are. Moses did all sorts of tricks, didn't he, with it in the face of Pharaoh. But never mind all that for a minute, yeah? The big point came with the great thing that, that God ever did for the Jewish people was to get them out of Egypt. And he's got them going down and comes to the Red Sea. So he's faced with the Red Sea in front of him and he's faced with the Egyptian army behind him, cross as a wasp. Do you have wasps in Florida? Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean, okay. And he's really stuck, isn't he? He's got all these people with him, and the way ahead is barred, and the way behind is barred. Yeah? What did he do? He waved the staff of God at it. And the way ahead was formed for him, wasn't it? Okay? Exactly the same thing happens. If you're faced with listening to families and talking with families and they get into situations where the way ahead appears impossible. You just don't. In your wisdom, you don't know how to go forward from here. Yeah? I must tell you, there is an answer. Wave the cross at it. Take hold of the problem, yes? And proclaim the message of the cross to the problem. And the way ahead usually parts for people. All right, so far? Right. So Moses and the children get across the water and they all set off into the wilderness. And they've been going a few days and they haven't got any water. And they get pretty darn thirsty, yes? I mean, you did, they didn't cross over and find a table all laid out for them then with cookies and bottles of water and stuff on there. Well, they just had to go for it. They had nothing. So, of course, a couple of days into all this, they are getting desperately thirsty. And the flocks and herds and things they had with them, desperately thirsty. And Moses says, well, and he takes them around the corner, and there's this lake. Isn't that a blessing? Right in front of them, called the Lake of Mara. Unfortunately, as soon as somebody licked it, yeah, they found out that, in fact, it was acid wasn't it? it was toxic it was what's the word Ginny brackish thank you wasn't it it had gone off yeah not very nice at all so they got a bit cross with Moses they were gonna say Mose what are you up to you yeah you're supposed to be leading us and you, you, you your management is terrible you know, we, we go around the corner and the, the only lake you can find is brackish. We can't even drink, yeah? So Moses turns around and he says, oh, Lord, what am I going to do? Yeah? And the answer is, guess what? A piece of wood. Yeah? 
God says to Moses, look down there on the beach, there's a piece of wood, pick it up and throw it in. So Moses goes and he picks up this piece of wood and he hurls it with all his might into the lake, yes? Which is, to me, complete biblical proof that he must have had a Labrador. Is that right? Right. Immediately he threw the cross into, I'm sorry, the bit of wood into the water. The water turned pure and the people were refreshed. Yes? So I'm, I have to say this to you. If you, with other people's lives, come across brackish situations, yes? Situations that have gone sour. They might be anything to do with jobs or families or relationships or physical things, yes? Throw the cross at it. Well, throw the message of the cross, yes? Is that okay? Just think of Moses and chuck the bit of wood in. Always rely on the message of the cross because for those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message is the power of God, yes? took me an awful lot to get used to actually working this way because I thought I could engineer the power of God through prayer. The prayer was the answer, yes? Well, it's jolly good, but it isn't actually terribly obedient because what Jesus is saying to us through his word is that the power of God that he wants used around here is in the message of the cross. So give it to him. Yes, folks? All right, so far? Well, off they set. And they're trundling through the wilderness, yeah? And they get caught. They get caught up a canyon by a group of people called Amelikites, yes? I mean, they were pretty awful people. I'm, I call them nastyites. They were pretty nasty right the Amalekites were I mean still are for all I know but they were professional full time brigands yeah I mean they made their living out of raiding trade caravans and that sort of thing and stealing and, and murdering travellers and yeah pinching all their stuff and so on they were pretty nasty but they made their living out of smashing up other people. So these were professional killers, yeah? And they come charging on presumably horses or camels or something, round the corner up the canyon, and there's all our lads and lasses all stood there. Now, what you've got to bear in mind here is that these people have been slaves for about 750 years. I mean, what do they know about sword fighting and stuff like that, yeah? absolutely nothing I don't even know if they had the strength because they'd have had 750 years of really bad dieting yeah All right, I think I'll forget that because yeah I'm in the States bad dieting doesn't necessarily get rid of all your strength does it anyway yeah Tex-Mex I expect but you take my point, don't you, is that there's no way those people knew about strategy or defense or, did they? No, no way. So what are they going to do? I mean, they, they are up for a bad beating. Yeah? So Moses, the great leader, says, I'll leave you to it. I'll put Joshua in charge. Yeah, I'm going up on the top of the hill overlooking the canyon. Yeah? It sounds like good leadership, but it really means I'm out of here. You get on with it, yeah? So Joshua's down there in the bottom of the canyon with all these pretty unarmed and pretty badly trained people on foot. The Amalekite army is charging up on them. Moses is sitting on the top of the cliff overlooking the canyon, yeah? Now what does Moses do? What he does is he holds up the staff of God over the battle. When he's holding it up, we start winning. Against all the odds, you wouldn't believe it was possible, but we start winning. 
After a bit, Moses gets a bit weary with holding his arm up like this, yes? And when he lets it down, he soon finds out that the Amalekites start winning. I mean, no pressure, you know? So he starts to jack the staff of God up again over the canyon, and we start winning. It, it's something which is in the way that God works in the kingdom which you could not work out for yourself. If we sat down and had a conference to say, how are we going to do this, yes? We'd never get anywhere. There are lots of Christian conferences where people stand up and say, this is what you should do. You should prophesy over people. You should have words of knowledge. You should have lots of, yes, um, you know, preformed ideas about what types of spirit are involved in and all this stuff, yes? But actually... Oh, that reminds me. Oh, one of the first day courses I ever did was on the laying on of hands. Yeah? Um, as in, where do you put your hands? Well, you know. And, and they were teaching me something I never really understood, is that when you put your hands on somebody's head, when you're praying with them, you must hold the hands two or three inches off the top of their head in case they're demonized and the demons can jump across and get into your hands and then into you and all this sort of stuff. Didn't seem to bother Jesus a lot, but, you know. Yeah? And so I came home knowing all about the laying on of hands, whereupon the first lady that ever came to see us, Ginny, for prayer, yeah? Is she still there or she gone to sleep? Yeah. That was when a, a very early colleague of ours, Sheila, was with us. Sheila Howard, do you remember? Bless her heart. And, and this lady came in, and she was, um, how can I put this politely, well endowed. Is that all right? And she said, I have a small lump on my breast. Do you administer the laying on of hands? You've you never seen me run so fast. <laughs> I was nearly out the door. I crept round the back and let Sheila do it. I think. So Moses is on the top of the mountain, and every time he holds up the staff of God, we win. We're gaining ground. Joshua seems to be in control of it. When Moses gets a bit tired and goes, whoa, like this, they start winning. Yes? This is outside the capabilities of human beings. You couldn't organize that. You couldn't organize a power like that to save your lives, yes? However well entrenched you are in your own ministry, it won't achieve like that, yeah? But the cross will, yeah? What I love about that particular story is that there was two guys who went up with him. One called Her, and the other called Aaron, what's it? Her. His Christian name was Ben. Do you remember? And they were up there with him, and they saw Mose getting a bit weary, so they got a stone and sat him down, and then they stood either side of him holding his arms, yes, so that the staff of the God was up over the canyon all the time. Result? Victory. We win. Yes? Now, there's something deliciously corporate about that, isn't there? It's a corporate effort. Nobody stood there and said, oh, the pastor's more religious than we are. Let him get on with it. Yes? Hello? Do you get the message? It's the church operation. It isn't, it's for anybody and everybody. It isn't for specialists. Yes? Just tell them the message of God. So I loved it because, the, anyway, on they go. Yes? Round and round and round. And after they've been going for a while, and God graciously is giving them manna, yeah? Quails and things like that. So they're, they're getting on all right. And they're traveling around. But after a lot of years, they just get so fed up with the same food every day. So they go and see Moses, and they say, Moses, can we go back to Egypt? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, you could get what you, proper food. I mean, manna's okay, but honestly, it's the same stuff over and over again. 
go back to Egypt, we get pizza, spaghetti bolognese. Do you know what I mean? Do, do we have to do this? And actually, God got a bit cross with them because he thought, excuse me, I've been going to a lot of trouble to look after you guys, you know. And look at, you could do nothing but complain about it. Yeah, you'd make good Christians. And, and what happens, yeah, is that they get a plague of snakes. Plague of snakes. And some get bitten, don't they, and get very, very ill. And some die, I think, if I remember. But God, they went to Moses and said, Moses, could you please get God to stop, take these blooming snakes away? So God went, Moses went to talk it over with God. God did not take the snakes away. Yes? What he did do is provide them a way out. He said, get a great big stick. We're back in the wood again. Yeah? Stick it upright. Make yourself a snake out of bronze and nail it to the top of the cross, to the top of the bit of wood. Yeah? So this particular Moses story I call the snake on the stake. Yeah? You put a piece of wood in there, right? If you're interested where that's been described in, in, in the Pentateuch, in, in um, I don't know if it's Leviticus or Numbers off the top of my head, where that story is being described, the Hebrew word for the bronze snake, just to make sure you understand the picture, is exactly the same Hebrew word that's used in the Garden of Eden to describe the devil, the snake, yes? So that's what's happening. Hmm. And the word from God was, do that, put that bronze snake up on the stick, right? And if you can get the people to gaze at it, they'll be healed. Which is what I've been saying to you all day long, uh, really, yes? If you can get the person who is suffering to gaze at God, that's when healing comes because you give the kingdom elbow room. Yeah? Are you beginning to see how this fits together yet? Gosh, I hope so. Yeah? So, so what's happening here is that I don't mean, of course, you know, that you should hold up a, you know, like you're facing Dracula or something. Hold up a cross and po poke it at them. I mean, get the, it's, this is like the moon and the sun and the dark earth, isn't it? Yes? Get them to gaze at God. Now, the way you can gaze at God is by actually telling them what happened on the cross. That's all you need to do. Why? Because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Yes? But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So if you can get them to absorb the message of the cross, right? You are giving them the power of God. You've actually seen this work before lunch up here, so, okay. Right. What happened was, of course, they all got healed. If you then jump to a rather interesting chapter in John's Gospel, which is John chapter 3, that is worth a read. And another read, because here you have John, who's, to me, arguably, is the loveliest writer to read in the Bible and he is describing a conversation between Jesus the son of God and a guy called Nicodemus who was the leading Jewish theologian of the day yes so it's a conversation well worth reading and in it when you will get round to a little verse called John 316 which you will know yes John 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Yes. Jesus is trying to explain to Nicodemus that the Son of Man, i.e. himself, has to be lifted up like that, like Moses lifted up the bronze snake. Yes? And everybody gazed at it and were healed. Yeah? Jesus is saying that's what's going to have to happen here to save the world. The Son of Man is going to have to be lifted up. All right, so far? Okay. 
what I need you to understand here, the enormity of this, is all tied up in the word so. Because 3.16 says God so loved the world. So what you and I do is use a modern interpretation of the word so and we tell people God so loved the world that he, yes? So is a, just describes how much he loved the world. Enormously loved them, yes? God so loved the world. But actually it doesn't mean that. I'm afraid if you go back to Greek when you read the word so you will actually find the word in Greek is thus t-h-u-s thus yes in other words when John is writing about this because this is John saying 316 is written by John not by Jesus do you see what I mean okay and John is saying that's the way so thus is the way that's the way that God loved the world yeah that he raised his only begotten son are you with me? Now the implication of that, yes, is that, oh, of course I understand the gifts of the Spirit insofar as anybody can. Of course I know you will get powerful things like words of knowledge about people and healings and gifts and prophetic stuff. Yes, of course, yes. But if you want to get to the root of everything that God has expressed love in the world, right, it won't be in how you pray for Mary next week. The major way the nuclear explosion of God's love in the world happened on Calvary. Okay. It's most important that you see that. That God has done what God has done. To affect our... That's when, you know, when, when Isaiah says... Uh, you know, God has taken all our pain, our sickness, grief, and so forth, and by his wounds we're healed. Yes? And I hear silly Christians saying to people, therefore you must be healed because, you know, God's healed you and because Jesus died, therefore you are healed. So there you are. Aren't you happy? Yes? But that's not the thing. That's not the right construct on this at all. The right construct is that a nuclear explosion happened nearly 2,000 years ago on that hill outside the city. Jesus was crucified. Now, here's the significance, right? He got out of the way anything that could come between you and the love of God. You see, up until then, there was a lot of stuff, frankly. I mean, we walked out of Eden. Yes, There was a lot of stuff in the way of sin and the development of sin and the development of human wisdom and all these things which just creates barrier after barrier after barrier because you can't mix oil and water. You cannot get God to come to humanity. He had to do it himself in Jesus, but it's difficult. Now what the cross does is camouflage you. So when God looks at you, surprisingly, right? It is to me anyway. What he sees is somebody who looks like Jesus. Because anything that could come between you and God is now, it might still be there, but it's ineffective. God can bust through it, right? So I want you to see that, it, that the great huge thing here was actually happened in the temple when that curtain was torn from top to bottom because I know we Christians teach each other isn't that wonderful now we can all go into the throne of grace and pray with the Lord yes of course you can yeah but the, don't miss the big one the big thing here is that now God can get to us right so what you're faced with in your heart when you're actually praying with people is this the kingdom of God you know the picture of it it's painted in Genesis in Eden the kingdom of God starts marvelously without all this nonsense we have to live with. It's going to finish like that, yes? The Bible stretches in between. God's main purposes, folks, are to get us from Genesis to Revelation. All right? That's his main objective in the universe, is to put the universe back into the Eden condition right the main objective is to get us from genesis to revelation 
he knows he couldn't do that without sending Jesus because he can't do the business with us so he sends Jesus yes and Jesus shows us what God's like Jesus said yes to absolutely everybody without any exception especially without all the exceptions made up by the Christian healing ministry he said yes to everybody and said I only do what I'm seeing the father doing that's all because the father is trying to get us all back into the Eden condition what Jesus does with the father is get the cross organized so that he can get out of the way permanently when we come to Jesus yes you get out of the way those things that lie between us what we have to do is to acknowledge what he's done on the cross and it's all there yeah so never mind working at praying for people yes for healing I know you probably all do it but I'd advise you not to bother not because you're wrong yes not because you're wrong you could actually you know it's very easy for you to ride a horse from here to Houston Texas isn't it it's very easy for you to drive from here to Houston Texas isn't it well for goodness sake use the airplane yeah and the, that way of doing things is the God designed method this is my worry about modern church we're forever dreaming up new and fancy methods of our own and then searching into scripture to try and justify it the God designed method is to proclaim the kingdom of God and the message of the cross well that's the end to it you do any more than that you run an awful risk of getting in the way and interfering with what God's trying to do yeah okay sandwich fillers your job is to teach them just that if anybody comes in here yeah I mean I advise you not to go find sick people because Jesus never did that either he waited for them to come to him yes what I would honestly suggest you do is whatever anybody wants prayer for whatever it is it doesn't matter whether it's a physical emotional relationship spiritual it doesn't matter yes the way is always the same proclaim the kingdom of God and tell them the message of the cross yes and the message of the cross is simply this now because of Jesus there is nothing that can come between them and the love of God yes it's not difficult is it now because of Jesus healing actually belongs to those people yes they don't have to earn it by being holy you don't have to earn it by rushing home and making long lists of people you've never forgiven you don't have to Jesus never did this is grace yes yeah okay so if you then want to pull the message of the cross together you are left with this picture in revelation of what is happening in heaven today and what is happening today is that there is a river called the river of life and if you look at Psalm 46 verse 4 it'll tell you there is a river whose streams make glad make glad cheer up make happy the city of God where the most high dwells heaven chuckles heaven enjoys us swimming in a river he enjoys to see his children splashing about in the river yes the river of life is the one that's flowing down the middle of the street in heaven underneath the tree with the leaves for healing of the nations yes it flows back through that torn curtain which it can do now back into this world back into this country back into this city back into this church and all over us but it's doing it all the time yeah if any of you are ministers your job is not to get God to do stuff it's done it happened on Calvary the the the, the door was opened the curtain has been split yeah the river flows you ministers here in this room you do not have to get God to do anything what you have to do is to pick folks up 
and try and chuck them in the river of what's going on all the time yeah it's very easy it's very simple the system is designed for children so you've got no excuse yes and if I say to you that which I believe to be true because I have watched Jesus in the Gospels yes and I have noticed with rather interest that the whole Bible lies between Genesis and Revelation. Yeah? The whole of life is just getting us from there to there. And right in the middle, bang, here comes Jesus. And he says, come on, this is what the kingdom's like. Yes to everybody. That's what it is. Yes? Scripture says all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. Why? does so much of the church think that healing the sick is optional is quite beyond me in fact I would go as far as to say at the risk of upsetting all of you I think it's a disgrace because God requires to return you and me ill people, suffering people people who are lost, people who are struggling yes don't we pride ourselves in churches being interested in pastoral care and we won't have anything to do with healing them it's crazy yes it's because we don't trust God actually but this the, the message of the cross is at your fingertips folks yes the message of the good news of the kingdom is a great big box riding on your shoulders yeah and the cross is in your fingertips please yeah one step of obedience reveals the truth to you. Yeah? You come across brackish rivers, chuck in the wood. You have been so good to me all day. You've actually sat there and listened. I'm really quite honored. I've come to the end. Yes?